Hello, welcome to Teach the Word. Uh, there's a cool thunderstorm in the background, so I don't know if you'll be able to hear that or not. Um, I uh, want to continue talking about faith uh, t- today. Uh, we'll start by praying for God's help. Heavenly Father, we need your help to think clearly, to read your word uh, and understand it. And so we just ask for your help on on me as a presenter and on anyone who listens, Lord, that you would help us to be touched by the truths in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, faith, like uh, any common word, has a lot of different, uh, like, uh, meaning senses is the word I would use for it. Um, and... And that's true in in the Bible, just like anywhere. Um, I think I mentioned that last time, but like um, it, it means uh, it's used for uh, you know uh, not doubting um, a reference to the religion. Uh, like if you look. For example, let's just look at some some sorry instances of what I'm talking about. Uh, Galatians 1, 23. But they were hearing only. He formerly persecuted us. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. I think that's kind of in the sense of the religion he was trying to destroy. Uh, you get get a similar thing in uh, Titus 5, 8, for, or sorry, Timothy. 1 Timothy 5, 8. Um, you, get, uh, you get a definition of faith in Hebrews uh, 11. It's the way that the author's using it. He calls it uh, 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So that's believing what was what's promised by God. That basically, is how the he, writer of Hebrews is doing it. Um, that that what God promised is is going to come true and is true. It's because of a belief in God. But it's it's the substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of the things not seen. So you don't see. He gives a whole bunch of examples of God's interacting with the Old Testament uh, saints. You know, like God promising a seed. Uh, offspring to Abraham and Abraham not having a child for, you know, he was waiting, takes 25 years in the timeline in Genesis for, for the child to be born. But if, when Abraham wavers and doubts, he, you know, he has the whole incident with Hagar and Ishmael. But so his faith is, 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 you know, not that solid, but the idea is the evidence of things hoped for, what was it? The uh, substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. So this is about doubt, I think. So, you know, believing that what doesn't look like is happening because you believe in the God who promised. Uh, There's also, you know, like uh, kind of like asserting something to be true, I think. Um, I think you see that in, uh, in James. Like, uh, it's not like putting confidence... And it's just a, it's just an ascent. Uh, this bit in James two. Pull that up. I'm having. Uh, where are we? James. What was that reference? James two. Eighteen. But someone will say, "You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith." Without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Uh, there's a connection, faith and belief, that we don't uh, have in English, that we do have in the biblical languages, and that they're the same word. Uh, there's a verbal form of the word, a verb, that's believe, we, that gets translated believe, and there's a no- nominal form, a noun form, and that's faith. So the demons have this faith in God. But it's not the same kind of faith. It's just 
an assent that God exists. It's true that God exists, but they don't have their confidence in God like a believer. See, see the difference? See the nuance? How there's a lot of meaning, different kinds of meaning senses, but, uh, the, the important thing is that the Bible kind of develops, uh, a, a particular, uh, meaning sense that as a, you know, important in, in the, in the theology of the Bible and the storyline of the Bible. One of these senses kind of gets developed and, so let's just focus on this. Uh, try to look at some of these references. So that, sorry about the beeping. Uh, the rice pot's done. So you got amuna or emuna, which is faith, uh, the Hebrew word for fi- for faith. That's the the noun form, and the, then then <laughs> amin, which is the the verb form. So the the root's the same. It's actually the root for uh, our our English word "amen." It's the A M E Amuna Amuna Hemin. Anyways, so faith and believe they're the same thing. They're the same word. It's the same, but one's a noun form, one's a verb form, and uh, it's all vast majority of of Old Testament occurrences of that is um, it's communicating that somebody considers another to be steady, trustworthy, or true to their word. It can, it can be in, in human relationships. It can, it can be in, uh, you know, can be in the human to God, divine relationship, but, you know, with kings, kings and, and subjects. But basically it's, is that you have confidence in someone or something to, to be, uh, true to the word, you know. So I, I did a, a kind of a, fairly lengthy analysis here. So I looked at a uh, hundred occurrences of, of the, those words, either believe or faith. So, uh, emuna or emin and, uh, that, that family of words, that word family, the amen word family kind of. And, uh, that was, that was the most frequent sense that uh just putting confidence in someone but then there's a kind of a nuanced sense so how did i phrase that let me just read that from what i wrote here used to communicate the steadiness or trustworthiness of god or some righteous person okay sorry that's the the noun form the the steadfastness or trustworthiness of God or some person some some good you know a good guy that you're putting trust in that's the noun form emuna the verbal form is communicating that one considers another like God or a person to be steady trustworthy or true to their word so it's the same thing just as a noun and a verb they are the, the person is steadfast, trustworthy, or God is steadfast, trustworthy, or um, I'm considering God to be trustworthy, steadfast, or this person to be trustworthy, steadfast. I believe in them. That's the verb. Or or they are faithful. That was, so it's usually a kind of what we might call an adjective. God is steadfast. All right, so maybe this is boring. I'm getting too much into linguistics, so let's just back up to the important thing. The important thing I'm trying to get at is kind of a sub category of of these the Old Testament occurrences of this this verb he'emin, and that's when it's he'emin be, which is uh, it's believe in. So the the preposition there's a preposition following it. It's believe with a preposition, and and that uh, so that that meaning sense is is marked uh, grammatically in a sense because it has has the the noun or the verb and the preposition but it also has it has a distinctly different flavor to it uh so let's look at some some instances of it um starting in genesis um genesis 15 with abraham and god uh genesis 15 6 and he that's abram believed god or sorry, and Abram believed in the Lord, and he, uh, he is, is 
capitalize here, God. And he believed in the Lord, and he credited it to him for righteousness. So Abraham believes in God, and God considers Abraham righteous because of his faith in God, his faith in him, his confidence in him. Uh, what else? Exodus. Exodus 14.31. Uh Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So here the English translation doesn't use the word, the, the preposition in, but the, the underlying Hebrew does. So Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done. So the people feared the Lord and they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The sense here is the same, I believe the same as, as in uh, the Genesis 15 passes with Abraham. So with Abraham, you have it. With the nation of Israel, you have it. It's defining their relationship to God. And I believe that it... I'm, I'm trying to make a case that this is marked grammatically, that, that this meaning sense of total uh, confidence and, and um, throwing oneself ab and with total abandon at the mercy of God because you have total confidence in him to come through. So Israel has total confidence in God because they're seeing the great works which he's doing. Uh, which he did in Egypt, and they fear him, and, and they have faith in him to come through and to, to take care of them and to provide. Just like Abraham believed God with with the promise of the, the son, and so God credits it to him as righteousness. Now, uh, yes, Abraham Abram wavers in that belief in that whole incident with Hagar and, and Ishmael, but at least at the beginning he's believing, and the nation of Israel is believing in this this sense you just see how I wrote this to try to define this this specialized or more nuanced uh, meaning sense. So it's a I, I, this is far less common. I, I mean, I'm only finding a handful of attestations of it, but it's it's the idea. It, it's particularly related to God and people and His saving people, salvation, um, and that's uh, where are we here? Is the it's the relationship of dependence on, so you're throwing, one, one throwing themselves in relationship of dependence on another. So it's not always used with man and God, but it's, it's, it's he'emin be. It's the, the one party throwing themselves into a de relationship of dependence on the other party, totally trusting and depending on them to come through. Uh, so we see that in Genesis with Abram, we see that in Exodus with the nation of Israel, um, if you look in Numbers 14, 11, very similar. Uh, the context of Numbers 14 is that people are refusing to enter Canaan uh, because they're too scared of the giants that the spies report. And, uh, and uh, so where are we here? 14 and uh, verse 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I perform, have performed among them? So this is God giving a negative review of the people that they do not believe in him. Again, the, pre the preposition, be, which it would be in in English, isn't translated because that's just a choice of the translators. So could uh, then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me? with all the signs which I have performed among them. I like the believe in, because I think in our, our uh, tw what is this, 21st century English, American English, when we use the first believe in, I believe in X, Y, or Z, it's, it's a similar meaning sense to be putting uh, confidence in. Uh, it's similar to the meaning sense in the Bible of that's used around salvation, and with faith and salvation, God providing ways of salvation and faith in God, that one's throwing oneself in a relationship of dependence on God to save them. Um, that's why I, I'm, <clears throat> I like the in translation. Uh, so, you know, here are just a couple more uh, Chronicles. Second Chronicles, actually. Eight. 
do 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 or maybe maybe I should stop so I don't know what time I'm at so I don't run out of time 15 minutes in all right let's stop I, my other references with this this meaning sense marked with grammatically with the preposition I mean that believe in our second chronicles uh where where's my where am I lost my place 2020 second chronicles 2020 and psalm 119 66 um so let's move on so i think it's important to move on because uh we're trying to we're trying to build what the bible's doing with faith as it, and salvation the relate this video is, is more about faith, but primarily in the context of salvation and how the Bible develops a theme. Uh, Paul, in Romans, uh, takes uh, Romans 4. Let's just turn there and we can read it. But he takes the, the passage, the Abram passage that we were reading earlier, Genesis 15, and he quotes it, and he starts to build a very nuanced, he, he develops that meaning sense I mean, that believe in the meaning sense, which is which I, I would def I would spell out as throwing oneself into a relationship of dependence on another. Uh, so let's read it. Romans four. Starting at verse one. Uh, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, was found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about but not before God. But what does the scripture say? Abram, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. righteousness. So, Paul is is laying out the gospel message in the book of Romans about uh, the sinfulness of man, the righteousness of God, and how God requires a payment for the sin of man. He, it's not just a um, he's not just a lenient parent who lets them off the hook. He requires uh, a penalty and. And there's a substitute, which is Christ Jesus. There's a way of salvation, which is a sacrifice that Christ has made. But there's a requirement, and, and Paul strongly develops this requirement of faith. Faith in God's provision of a way of salvation. Um, so, And this is not like a, a thing that's new to Paul in the, in the New Testament. He, and he's, he's showing how it's a pattern throughout, uh, like... You see this pattern a lot in the Old Testament, like the, the flood. Noah builds an ark, and people would have to believe that God has provided a way of salvation from the wrath to come. They have to first believe there's wrath that's coming, and that way of salvation was the ark. Because the New Testament talks about Noah as a preacher of righteousness to his generation. Uh, and nobody got in the ark except Noah and his kids and, his, and their wives. So no one put their confidence you know, abandon themselves to the, in, by faith to their confidence in Noah's ark, that God had provided that as a way of salvation. Similar in Exodus uh, with the angel of death passing over. They had to uh, put their faith in the, the, the fact that God had provided a way of salvation from this angel of death, which was sacrificing a lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost. Jesus in the New Testament is a picture of that sacrificial lamb. He is the Passover lamb. That's actually what Paul says in, in Corinthians. But he, he also dies at Passover. He's crucified. So it's it's kind of hard to miss the, the point that's being made uh, that he is the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And that's, you know, the Gospel of John. That's the, the confession about Jesus of John the Baptist makes. But anyways, what, what I'm trying to get at, maybe I'm, I'm not... <clears throat> being particularly clear, but is that God provides a way of salvation, but it's not just, it, it doesn't just happen automatic. One has to put their trust, has to abandon themselves, 
you know, throw themselves into a relationship of dependence on God and, and believe that God's way of salvation is going to work and kind of act on it. They had to put the, they had to sacrifice the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. They had to get in the ark. Um, they have to, um, accept, confess, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth. That's what Paul's claim is in Romans. The act to th- they, you have to throw yourself into a relationship of dependence on God for salvation from your sins. That's the argument being built in Romans. So, where am I going with all this? So, I want to point out some things about this Romans 4 passage. So, Paul's quoting the the Hebrew passage that we read earlier, the, the I mean, the, in, in Genesis 15, right? Um, and he's using very similar uh, to Hebrew, how Hebrew uses a Greek uh, or a, a noun and a verb. Well, he uses a Greek noun and verb. I, I don't uh, know Greek, so I can't really read, but it's like, I don't know what it is. It's like pisteno, something like that. And uh, pistis, which is the uh, one's the verb, one's the noun of the Greek word uh, for faith or belief. Same thing. Um, and he's communicating this. So, so he's, he's making it pretty clear the, the, the connection with faith and salvation. He says, I'll just read it again. Now, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So that's belief in God to provide justification for, for our sins. Um, it's important to note that, that there's in New Testament Greek, there's a lot of meaning senses also for, for the word faith, just like in Old Testament Hebrew. Um, these, these Greek words, which is what the pistis and whatever that, that word family or the he, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't really, I don't know Greek at all. So my, don't, I can't, don't, I can't pronounce it. I can't really read it. So I can just, I kind of can just look at the letters anyways. Um, and I don't really know what any of the words mean. Again, there's a lot of meaning senses, but there's a theologically important meaning sense, which is totally depending on God alone, only God for everything. And that, that's the, that's the sense of faith in the New Testament that God wants. That's the kind of faith God is requiring in people who come to him to totally depend on him for everything. Um, we could look at, uh, maybe passages, New Testament passages that kind of are showing this sense, just like we looked at some Old Testament passages. So let's just look. Very common one, John 3.16. Maybe you can quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What's the requirement here? Belief in God. Putting one's dependence total dependence in God alone, only God, for everything, including everlasting life. Uh, What else have we got? Um, How about Acts? When the gospel is spreading um, around the world, the message is going forth. Acts, uh, we can look 10, 43. Peter, this is where it's spreading to the Gentiles. And Peter is, is speaking to him. He's, he's preaching about Jesus. To him, all the pro- prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him, this is Christ, whoever believes in Christ, will receive remission of sins. So total dependence on God or Christ Jesus for uh, alone, o- Christ alone for the remission of sins. For everything, um, Romans ten. What I what I was talking about earlier, the confessing with your mouth. I think uh, I think that's what I'm getting at here. Yeah, if you confess ten nine, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. It's a quote of uh, from uh, 10, 11, that's a quote from Isaiah 28, 16. Confidence in God. You won't be put to shame if you have your if you have confidence in God. Um, how about Galatians three eight? This this might really give us help us with the sense of in, in faith alone. And the scripture, Galatians three eight. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, "In you all nations shall be blessed." So, this is the. This is true not just for the Jews, but it's true for the Gentiles. Justification by faith, putting totally depending on God alone for everything, including salvation from dead works, from sins. Um, I think I'll read from Galatians 2, because it's kind of important to show that what I mean by putting our faith in God alone. Uh, our trust, our dependence on God alone and not on other things. Um, Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, that's what he can do, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. It's the Total dependence in God alone and not depending on anything else. Not on how good I am, how wonderful I am. Um, you get the idea. Um, dependence on ourselves is totally precluded. You know, I think we mentioned in the last video, not just the works of the law, but also the confidence in the flesh from Philippians. It's, a, it's another phrase to describe the same, it's basically the same thing. But uh, Paul, Paul's Philippians 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And he goes on to talk about how he might have had confidence in the flesh by keeping all you know the various requirements of the law. But he doesn't. Because he counts it all as not. He doesn't place confidence in anything. It's only in his dependence is totally on God alone, not on anything of his lineage, his performance, none of it. Um, it's important to, uh, like I, I think I did this in the last video, but the it's not, it's not even your ability, you can't even put confidence in your ability to have faith in God. So everything's precluded by, by, by dependence, uh, um, I'm trying to change the setting on the computer. I can't. I'm getting distracted. Okay. No works. No, no dependence on on you, you, what you can do or who you are or any of your abilities. Even your ability to have the faith. Even your ability to put your total dependence on God. You can't even have confidence in that. And why do I say something like that? Well, let's look at some passages in the Gospels. Maybe shed some light on why I'm saying that kind of thing. Start with Luke. Luke 17, 5. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So where are they going to, to get uh, faith? Not, not to themselves, but to God. Their dependence is on God alone, even to have faith. They're depending on him. To, they're depending on him to be able to depend on him. Uh, Mark nine twenty four maybe is the same passage or slightly different. Let's see. I don't know. Mark nine twenty four. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, "Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief." This is in the context of um, believing in Jesus depending on Jesus to be able to provide for this man's family and particularly for his son who is uh, 
possess, demon possessed and, and the demon's trying to kill him by throwing him into the fire. And and he's crying out. He, he believes, but he, he doesn't have the ability on his own to believe. He's, he's just crying out, God, I need, I'm depending on you, but I know that I can't, I can't even depend on you without you enabling me to depend on you. That's the, that's the idea of, of, uh, total dependence on God. It's dependence on nothing else, nothing, none of me or my abilities, even my ability to depend on God and dependence on no outside thing. That's the theme or the idea of faith that is developed in the Bible for salvation. That's the faith that God is requiring of his people. Um, so it's, it's not just, it is important, you know, for, uh, salvation, but it's not, it's not just salvation. It's the entire Christian life. The entire walk with God is a walk of total dependence on God alone and continuing to revert back. Yeah. Dependence for salvation from dead works, from sin. Yes. Um, but it's also dependence the whole, uh, you know, walk the whole way whole way down the path um so let's just let's just uh try to show both with some scripture so first we'll start with forced dependence for salvation um um so god is requiring you know a dependence on him for providing the atonement for our sins and that we can't atone ourselves. This is illustrated beautifully in the with in the life of Abraham if in Genesis 22. If you look at the passage of Genesis 22, God is asking Abraham to go and sacrifice his child. Yeah, this is this is you're like, "What? Child sacrifice? Yeah, kill his child on an altar." And but Abraham is believing God that God is going to come through. He This is by the way, this is the child that God promised Abraham was going to have a seed, right? This is the whole theme of the book of Abraham and God's interaction is God makes a promise that he's going to have a son, a seed, and then he has the child and God tells him to go kill him. So Abraham, who believed God to provide the son, believes God to sustain the son. If he, if he kills the son, he's believing that God will raise him back to life because God has made a promise and he has total confidence in God. And he's believing and God comes through. God provides a sacrifice in place of his beloved son, a ram. Um, the idea is, I think, very much what happens in, uh, it's a parallel to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Abraham was so loved God, so dependent on God, he gave his only beloved son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish. So there's a belief that God has provided an atoning sacrifice for us, right? Dependence on God for the sacrifice. Um, and, and scripture, like we said before, it repudiates every other means of attaining righteousness. The works of the law, you see that we saw that in Galatians 2.16. You see the same thing about the works of the law in Galatians 3.11, uh, 3.24. You see it in Romans 3.20, um, 20 through 28, Romans 4, where we read earlier, 2 through 16. No other method of attaining righteousness except the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice God has provided. So we can't have confidence in anything but what God has provided. I think, I think that is um, kind of enough, right? Maybe we can read one of the Romans passages. Let's read Romans 3. And then we'll move on to having faith in God. Not for salvation, but for the the living the Christian life. Romans three. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. I used to be able to kind of hold the Bible here in front of the computer and flip through it, but now this this microphone is kind of in the way, so it makes it a little awkward. But it sounds better. Hopefully, you, you notice that. Therefore, Romans three twenty. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So, there you get it. There's, there, that, it's, it's faith, total dependence on God alone to provide for your salvation. But, Moving beyond that, it's total dependence on God alone every step of the way to live your life for all of the Christian life. Um, so there's a process we call, it's called, we, the term, technical term is sanctification, right? Becoming like Christ. That's, that's the process of the Christian life, of living the Christian life. You, you, you're being conformed into the image of, of Christ. And, uh, it's, it's a necessary outcome. Of salvation, if you look later in the book of Romans, you know, there's this, this kind of this construction. You know, because of everything God's done for us, therefore, I beseech you. So he's begging them. Therefore, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world. This is uh, Paul saying. This is the reasonable response to, the, to what God has done for us in the God, in the in the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? In the saving us out of darkness into light. So present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So. It'd be foolhardy to think that, okay, I was saved by putting my faith and confidence in God, not in myself, and I got this salvation, but now I'm going to be transformed into the image of Christ on my own uh, uh, by depending on myself. I'm going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps, morally improve. That's not the idea at all of Christianity. You need to have total dependence. I need to have total dependence and confidence in God every step of the way along the process of being conformed into his image and being transformed by him. With the renewing of my mind, I can't. My mind can't be renewed. I can't renew my mind without totally depending on God, because it's God who renews my mind. But I am an active agent, an active player in the process. Um. So that, that you get the idea. So that uh, it's it's also viewed as necessary. For, remember what I read earlier in James about how what you say you have faith but you don't do anything. You know, what gives? I'll just read that again. So it's it's a, it's expected. There's Sanctification is is an expected. A change in the Christian's life is expected after salvation. Um, and one of you said, uh, If a brother or sister is naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, so I'm James 2.15, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled. Maybe I should back up. How about 14? What James 2, 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked or destitute of daily food, the one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things that are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus, also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And it goes on, but the idea here is that uh, it goes on to give an example from the life of Abraham. The idea here is it's unthinkable to separate uh, and say, okay, I'm going to have faith in God for salvation, but then, uh, you know, I'm done. I'm done with having faith in God. I don't need to depend on God anymore. I'm just going to, I can go do my own thing. No. It's also one that you have to have faith in God for salvation, but you have to have faith in God to live uh, after salvation. That That's the one unthinkable thing. But the other unthinkable thing here is that you would come near to God, surrender yourself to him, have, have that total dependence on him, be transformed 
be saved by Christ's blood. And then you go on living as if nothing had happened and you continue to care, li- care or just live a selfish life and just care about yourself. You know, somebody says, hey, I'm, I need some food and clothing. You say, you know, oh, well, that's also unthinkable. So it's unthinkable that there's that sanctification, transformation isn't going to happen after salvation. That's the one unthinkable thing. And the other unthinkable thing is that it's going to happen without the same faith that was required for salvation, that total dependence on God. All right, so maybe we could look at, uh, how about Titus 3, to try to show the the dependence on God in the sanctification process. Or maybe, maybe we could look at a couple of scriptures, start at Titus. Um, hmm, Titus 3. Not, that's not Titus, that's Timothy. Okay, Titus 3. Start in verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So you you see there that God in his mercy, not by what we did, he comes in and he saves us, right? But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, towards men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we had done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see how they're just inseparably bound together. There's salvation and there's transformation. It's not it's not thinkable for, for Paul writing to Titus to separate the two. Uh, we can see that elsewhere, like if we looked at, uh, let's go to Philippians. Philippians. How about Philippians 2? Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, this is, this is therefore from what preceded, which is Christ's death on the cross. Therefore, my brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That is a great passage showing the effort on the part of the believer, work out your salvation, and the the part effort that, that it's really not the believer, it's God. But it, for it is God who works in you to both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He's giving you the desire and the ability to do, to, to live the transformed life. Uh, flip a little bit more forward in Philippians. You see this. Uh, verse chapter 3. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So this is transformation. It it could be talking about the end of the age when our bodies become a resurrection body, Um, but it could be understood also as in the present of transforming us to be like him. Uh, We have Ephesians. Maybe we can look there. Ephesians 2. For by the Ephesians 2 8. For by the grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. There you have it again. For the faith, for the saving faith is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we has been we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there, there it is beautifully. God saved us, and he has already prepared a path of good works for us to walk, the transformation path. He prepared it beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Um, you know, this is this is strong. It's, Paul's pretty strong on this. Uh, if you look in, in the kind of the theme of the book of, of Galatians is, you know, you can't begin and you can't have salvation in Christ and then live the Christian life by works. Um, if you look at, let's start in Galatians 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Um, it, it goes on, but I mean, the whole idea, the whole argument of the book of Galatians is that you can't become sanctified by f by following you know a, a list of rules in your own effort the the works of the law and it, when paul's saying look you received the gospel by faith you believed you put your total dependency and confidence in god not in a system of rules or a thing to follow that's how you need to follow live now that you've been saved you need to live be become transformed through Christ by lit by having your total dependence on Him alone, not in a system of rules, a legalism, a legal system, which is what they were doing. He's saying you're trying to do it on your own effort. Don't. So, I I think maybe I made my point. I, I should just stop. I, the, the point's pretty clear, right? That um, faith. That is total, the, in this technical sense that I've tried to show the Bible develops from the Old Testament into the New Testament of total dependence on God. Throwing oneself into a relationship of total dependence on God is how I like to say it. That kind of faith is what's necessary for salvation, but not just salvation, for sanctification. The act of living the Christian life, becoming like Christ. And it's that, it's that alone in total dependence on God alone and nothing else, not just for salvation, but also for sanctification. You can't start the Christian life by having total dependence on God to save you because, because you're from your sins and then move, then somehow graduate to, okay, now I'm going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. It's not how it works. That's the point I'm trying to belabor here. Um, if we go and we look at, uh, the uh, the book of uh, the chapter in Hebrews that I mentioned earlier that starts off with a definition of faith as um, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Um, this is where people are believing God to come through on His promises. You'll, you'll see in this chapter it's a whole catalog of people who were able to accomplish the impossible because of their total dependence on God. Um, that is, they were able to live victoriously a life of faith because they had that total dependence on God. I will just maybe just show some, you know, it talks about uh, Abel, uh, Enoch, Noah, you know, who was able to, to build the ark, be saved from the flood because he depended on God. Abraham, who was able to uh, live as a pilgrim and a sojourner on the earth because he believed in the promise of God. Um, there's there's many uh, that are talked about here. Moses, you know, taking the children of Israel out of Egypt, celebrating the Passover. Even talks about uh, non-Israelites, uh, Rahab, the harlot, who, because she had faith in the Israelite God, she didn't perish in the destruction of the Canaanites. She was saved um so the, the point here is that uh without faith it's impossible to please god because you have to to believe you have to put your trust and confidence totally in him alone in order to live in order to do the impo the, the 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 impossible of living a transformed life having victory over sin which might seem like an impossibility to Many people, or maybe to you, or if you're listening, but it is a possibility because of God. With you, no, but God, you, but, but God, yes.
the possibility is there. Um, it doesn't work though if um, if we go back to self reliance. So there's a there's a big contrast between faith that's the total dependence on God alone and then self reliance trying to do it on my own. Uh, there's a passage in uh, Romans uh, that kind of is a I I think is a very beautifully depiction, maybe even poetic depiction of the problem of self-reliance and then reliance on God. It'd be a lot to read, but maybe we can just read some snippets. Um, How about Romans 7.15? For what am I doing? Or 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what am I doing? Again, Romans 7, 15. I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then another uh, law, I find then a law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So he's he's struggling, right? He's struggling with sin. He What he wants to do, he's not doing. Why is the struggle? The struggle is, is because of self-reliance. But he doesn't leave you there, hanging. It, it keeps going, so... That's where the chapter breaks. So you might think it was it, you were left there, but it, it moves on to the solution in chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What's, what's going on here? It's rather than reliance on myself to try not to do it, I'm doing the thing I don't want to do. We, we call this white knuckling, right? Trying, you know, squeezing your fist and clenching your teeth so hard, I'm not going to do it. And, and you know, and your knuckles turn white. That's not the solution. That that's self reliance. That's not the life of faith. What's the solution? Dependence on God. Totally throwing yourself into a relationship of total dependence on God alone. That's what's described beautifully here in chapter eight about the you know life in the spirit. Uh, so where was I? Three. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's the living not in self-reliance. Living in self-reliance is walking according to the flesh. Living in total dependency on God alone is uh, is living according to to walking according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god God, nor indeed can it be so then those who are in the flesh cannot please god but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you now if anyone does not have the spirit of christ he is not his and if Christ is in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption 
by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And this, this goes on. Uh, I mean, it's re- this whole thing really started in, in uh, chapter 6, but I started in the middle of 7 and I stopped in the middle of 8. But you see it very clearly. You got the depiction of walking in the flesh. That's trying not to do the thing you don't want to do really hard and failing. Or living in the Spirit. That is being transformed by God's power, having that total reliance and dependence on God. Uh, so the, the Holy Spirit uh, is, you know, he's the empowerer. Uh, he empowers us to overcome sin. Not just to overcome sin, but to, to live all of the Christian life. That's just one piece of the Christian life. He empowers us to witness, uh, to sh- preach the gospel, to share the gospel. Um, but... You know, it goes on. I mean, uh, there's the there's a dependence on God. It should really be everything. Total dependence. Uh, living a life of faith, which is the life that pleases God, is having this total dependence on God for everything. Yeah, for salvation. Yeah, for transformation. For the ability to live. But really, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say having total dependence on God alone for everything. I mean, if look at... Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, maybe these are overstatements by Jesus, so it could be an exaggeration to say dependence for everything. But I'd like to think that they aren't overstatements, and really, we just need to be dependent on God for absolutely everything. Look, we have, what, it was Matthew 6, 25. Um, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So that's Matthew six twenty-five through 34 I think that... That pretty much sums up the point we're trying to make here is that about faith, faith that pleases God, the faith that's required of us and that the Bible requires of us is throwing ourselves into a relationship of total dependence upon God alone for everything. Yes, for salvation. Yes, for transformation to to be conformed into his image. Yes, to be a witness. But everything right down to, you know, where your next meal is going to come from, you know, what clothes, where your clothes are going to come from. Total dependence. And let's just close it with that. Abba, we love you. We want to be people that have this faith that the Bible demands of us. This this faith where we throw ourselves into a relationship of total dependence on you alone. And Lord, we know that it is so easy to slip into self-reliance, into um, wa- walking according to the flesh, into, you know, the confidence in the flesh and the works of the law and all that. Lord, please help us. Transform us. And we need faith, Father. Increase our faith. Help our unbelief to live for you, to please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining. Have a good day.